welcome to episode 19 of the Green Bean Podcast. My name is Katie, this is my best friend Jack, and you're visiting us in my studio in Devon, which is in the southwest of England, and you are very, very welcome here. Grab whatever project you're working on and a cup of tea and come and join us. This is a podcast about my creative practice, which includes drawing, that's my job, and a bit of knitting, a bit of sewing, and whatever other crafty projects I'm working on. In this episode in particular, I'm starting a new drawing project just for fun, which I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. I've got quite a lot of chat about knitting, and I'm going to be launching our very first knit along, which is pretty exciting. And I have a book review and a bit of chatter about my plans for the coming six months. Um, we're also taking you out on a walk on Dartmoor. We had a rare sunny day last week and managed to capture a little bit of footage of a nicer December day than it is today. I feel like it's been constantly raining since then, but you get to see a bit of Dartmoor at its wintry finest. So settle in with your project and your cup of tea and enjoy. <music> I'm about to start a brand new piece of scratchboard drawing on camera for you and I'm a bit nervous. I'm always a bit nervous to make that first mark and even more so to be recording it but um, I guess it's good to challenge ourselves. Um, and the piece I'm starting is actually a piece of fan art based on a knitwear design um, and the design is the Sea Cloak by Maria Muscarella who goes by the name of Ninja Chickens. Um, you might have seen her podcast here on YouTube. Um, and I fell in love with this cloak immediately when I saw her photos of it. It just captures something so magical. And I've been planning for a while to cast on my own version on Winter Solstice this year. And I just thought it might be nice if there was anyone else who wanted to join me to have a little knit along for this amazing project. And we could run it from winter solstice to summer solstice. So it's going to be a nice, relaxed knit along with lots of time to make this amazing, magical piece of knitwear. And I thought what better way to promote it than to do a piece of fan illustration based on the design. Um, so that's what I'm going for. It feels like it's been a long while since I've done a piece of artwork on Scratchboard, even though it's one of my favourite mediums to work in. It's incredibly time consuming and I tend to veer away from it, particularly for client work, because it's, um, it's a slow and tedious process. Um, for those of you who haven't seen me use it before, it's a, um, it's a commercially available art material, which is a sheet of card coated in china clay, which is white, and over the top of that is a layer of Indian ink, which is the black, and you make marks with a metal stylus scratching off the layer of black to reveal the white underneath. So it gives you a really, really nice stark contrast between black and white, and depending on the kinds of marks you make, you get these kind of different shading effects, and I really like working with it. Um, there's a slight lack of precision to the stylus that um, 
means that your drawing doesn't always look quite perfect and that's a good thing for me who is such a perfectionist to um, to not labour too hard on making things look just right. And the finished look of the artwork is something akin to an etching or a print, a lino print maybe. Um, it's really working into that um, negative space if you like. Um, you know, the marks you're making are light on dark rather than dark on light when you're using ink on a piece of paper. And there's just something soothing about that, um, the motion and the sensation of scratching that I can really get into the flow with it and enjoy the process um, in a way that feels completely different from working in pencil or pen. The thing that's really liberating about working in scratchboard after a long period of working in pencil recently is I have the freedom to chop and change between different parts of the drawing. So when I'm working in pencil I have to work from the top of the page down to the bottom so that I don't smudge what I'm doing, but that's not so important working in scratchboard. So if I want to take a break from drawing the figure I can start filling in some of the details around. So um, I'm not sure how much of it you're going to get to see coming together because this is probably a week's worth of drawing I have to do here. But um, I'm surrounding the character in the middle who's wearing the cloak. She's going to be sitting by the fire and there's going to be candles around the edge and pine trees and berries and a robin and all those kind of winter motifs that you you know, you just look at the image and get the sense of winter solstice. And then I guess when I'm finishing the cloak, when summer solstice comes around, I'll, um, I'll do a similar illustration that's more summer themed, because it would be nice to have a pair. And then if all goes to plan, if anyone wants to join me in my knit along, then I will give away these pieces of artwork as prizes for finished objects at the end of the knit along.
I am feeling a little bit all over the place with my knitting at the moment and there's various things going on contributing to that. Um, the first thing which is exciting is that I've finished a project since I last recorded so I'm wearing my Ginkka Fight top which was a pattern from the spring issue of Pom Pom magazine this year and I'm really really pleased with it but my goodness did it take me a long time and I don't really know why. Um, it was just one of many projects that I had on the go that I set aside in order to get the Scruffed's cardigan pattern finished and launched in time for Yarndale. So I actually cast this top on in June and finished it a couple of weeks ago at the end of November. Um, I had been looking forward to wearing it over the summer and that didn't quite work out so I'm doing my best to be brave and wear it now in December uh, when the house is warm enough. It's not really ideal for wearing outdoors but I am really really pleased with it. So I knitted it with Cocktails, a blend from John Arban which is a merino alpaca and silk blends. It's really really lovely and I surprised myself by choosing a pink. You'll um, you'll know if you're a regular viewer that pink is a slight stretch for me. I generally favour the green, the brown and the grey so it feels nice to have something um, that gives a bit of contrast to my wardrobe and green and pink go very happily together. So I'm finding that it it goes with a lot of my my dresses that I've made. Since finishing that I shifted to working full-time on my partner's Christmas present which is a pair of mittens. I'm just going to grab them for you. So I've been designing a pair of colourwork mittens for him based on The Legend of Zelda. Now I'm not a gamer by any means. I don't really know very much about the world of gaming other than what I pick up by listening to him play. Um, but what I can tell you is that these are based on Guardians from Breath of the Wild. Um, so there'll be one on each hand and on the palm there is a pattern based on the Triforce which is a symbol in the Legend of Zelda and the main background pattern is based on rupees which are the currency. So this is the right hand mitten. You can see that I finished it apart from the thumb and the left hand mitten is still on the needles and it's inside out because I knit my small circumference colour work inside out. So I'm just going to flip it to show you. The reason I knit it inside out is because it gives the floats a little bit of extra distance to travel around and helps with the tension. Um, it's a tip that was given to me by my lovely friend Ella Austin who is an amazing colour work designer. So you can see I'm pretty close to finishing the mittens. I've got uh, the best part of a pair and basically what's happened is I've run out of this bright blue colour and I was utterly convinced that I had purchased two balls of this um, but I've been a bit lax in documenting my stash on Ravelry lately, particularly my documenting of my Jamesons of Shetland which is the main yarn I like to use for colour work because I have so much of it and I tend to just buy odd balls here and there, one of this, one of that and use it in such small quantities that keeping track of it is a nightmare. So I have most of my stash well documented but not my Jamesons and I really learned a lesson in that this time because <laughs> I searched through my entire stash, every box, to try and find this one ball of bright blue that I imagined that I had before it occurred to me to go and look at my order history and discover that I had only ever ordered one ball. So that was frustrating and a bit of a waste of time. So I have since ordered an extra ball and I'm waiting for that to arrive from Shetland. Um, so in the meantime the mittens are on hold and I had to cast on something else. So the new project I decided to cast on was a pair of socks. I know, I know, I don't know what's happening. I'm turning into a sock knitter. Um, I don't even know who to blame. I don't know what's going on but um, I've turned in the last year from somebody who hated knitting socks and would never knit them to somebody who's knitted several pairs and honestly I just want to wear my hand knitted socks all the time which means that I need to make more of them 
and the pair I decided to cast on was not a difficult choice because a couple of weeks ago I went to a mini skein dyeing workshop at Rivenitz and this is what I dyed. <laughs> this amazing rainbow of kind of muted dual colours that I I got to mix all of these myself. Um, so Becky started us off with um, teaching us about the colour wheel and how we did primary colours and then secondary colours in between them and then tertiary colours and it was a really fascinating day, a really good mixture of creativity and stretching my mathematical um, muscle to try and you know figure out well if I want a colour that's halfway between this and that one then calculating the quantities of dye needed and it really gave me a lot of admiration for people who do dyeing for a living and the level of precision and artistry that's involved. So it was a full day's workshop from 10 till 4 and each of us had our own dye pot to work with with three beakers inside so we dyed one mini skein in each beaker at a time. So we did 12 in total, that's four rounds of dyeing. And it was it was such a lovely way of working because each person in the workshop, there were five of us, we came out with a rainbow of colours that was really specific to our own taste. I loved it. And you could kind of work at your own pace and uh, get inspired by what other people were doing. But at the end of the day, all the five of us came out with completely different rainbows of colours. And... Uh, yeah, this, this is mine. So what I've decided to cast on is something that uses the whole rainbow um, and that is a pair of pride socks and I'm just gonna grab them and show you the, uh, the start that I've made. So with these socks in mind I also purchased some mini skeins of a navy blue from Rivenitz. I bought four which is 80 grams altogether. That should be enough for a pair of socks for myself and um, I've had this idea in mind for a long time based on a design by a, uh, a knit designer called Yucca or Yuka. Um, it's spelled Y-U-K-A or their revelry name is Y-U-C-C-A like the um, like the plant um, and the design is the Nanami socks which uses short rows, German short rows I think, to create a diagonal rainbow stripe across the foot and I've been completely enchanted by them since I first saw them and known that I wanted to make a version of them. And the way that the pattern is written is really interesting construction so they're cast on with a provisional cast on at the heel and you work downwards towards the toe and then upwards towards the cuff as well but they're quite short like little ankle socks so not the kind of sock that I would get much wear out of. I much prefer a normal kind of full length sock. So I've decided to just knit a basic top down sock to my usual preference. So I'm not sure I've even talked about that before. So let's go for it. I like 72 stitches on a two millimeter needle. So that gives a really uh, quite a dense fabric. Um, I do a section of two by two rib at the top and then a few rows of garter stitch to, um, I don't know, I just like that little bit of definition between the ribbing and the stockinette portion. And then normally I would do ribbing for the body of the sock because I like the way the ribbing draws it in and makes it fit well, but I'm trying a plain vanilla sock for the first time. We'll see how it goes. So far I'm definitely enjoying the soothing knitting of it, um, but I'm not sure how it'll fit. Um, I will do a heel flap and gusset and then I will use the Nanami pattern to add a rainbow of mini skein stripes to my foot and I think, I mean it seems daft because it's going to use such small amounts of yarn but I think I'm going to do one row each of all 12 of my mini skein colours because I have 12 so why not? Um, and I just love the idea that it's going to use such a small amount of yarn that if I'm happy with these socks then I can make lots of different pairs with lots of different main colours. Um, and then I will um, continue and do my normal preferred toe which is a barn toe. Um, it's one that decreases down to a number of stitches like the top of a hat and then you thread the yarn through and pull it tight. There's no kitchener stitch involved. 
Um, and that has two benefits, the first of which is there's no kitchen stitch involved, but also it gives a slightly more pointed toe, which actually is a better fit for the shape of my foot anyway. I find the standard wedge toe um, doesn't fit the shape of my foot very well. So I, what's going to happen is, of course, the yarn for my partner's mitten is going to turn up and I'm going to not want to go back to that project. I'm going to want to just carry on knitting on my rainbow socks. But um, we'll see. I think a bit of a bit of colour work and a bit of plain stock in it are two quite different projects that can be worked on in different circumstances. So hopefully I won't get myself into too much trouble with uh, not wanting to finish the project that has been promised as a gift. Other thing that I've been knitting, of course, is a swatch for my Sear Cloak by Maria Muscarella or Ninja Chickens, which I'm going to be getting ready to cast on for our knit along on winter solstice, the 21st of December. And I thought I'd just take a minute to wax lyrical about the joy of swatching. I know that it's something that a lot of knitters don't take pleasure in and actively avoid, but for me it's one of the most uh, joyful and pleasurable parts of the process. I really like getting to know the feel of the yarn that I'm working with and the pattern that I'm going to be working in, although in this case it's just stockinette. If it's a cable or a colourwork pattern I really like the chance to have a go at that before I'm working on the actual project. Um, in this case, as you can see, I've swatched in the round because the cloak is going to be knitted in the round and steeped. So in order to get an accurate gauge, I had to knit in the round. Um, and I've measured it and my gauge is spot on, which is not something that normally happens with my first swatch. I normally have to do two or three swatches to get the gauge right. So I'm pretty happy that this, that this came right first time. Um, I do keep all of my swatches. You can see a few of them 
on the uh, notice board behind me. And gosh, you know, I like the idea of sewing them all into a blanket someday, but in reality, they're all different sizes and different gauges. And I just like them as a record of things that I've made, um, much like I like using Ravelry to document the projects through photos. I like having the swatches and it's nice, you know, I use Ravelry to document the needle size that I used. So then I can go back and look at my swatch and feel the fabric. And it's, it's something that I can use to inform my choices of needle size for future projects, that kind of thing. Um, so the yarn I'm going to use for my sear cloak is a 100% Jacob yarn from a small producer. Um, I actually, I met them when I was working at Blacker Yarns. They were a natural fibre company customer, so they brought in their own fleeces from their own sheep and had them spun into yarn. Um, they kept some in a natural grey colour and they had some dyed. And I saw this green hanging out in the dye plant and I just fell in love with it. That's not going to surprise anybody. Um, so I approached the customer when they were coming to collect their finished yarn and asked if I could buy a few cones worth of it for myself and they very happily said yes. So I, it's really nice that I know the person who kept these sheep and um, I know exactly where the yarn's been spun and where it's been dyed. It's all very local to me. So it feels like an excellent choice for my sear cloak. Um, for the contrasting colours, because it does have a bit of colour work at the bottom of the cloak, I'm going to be using some Swaledale yarn that I've had in my stash for a while. And at the moment that's all in a natural kind of white grey colour. And I'm planning to dye it using lichens. Again, it's something that's going to make the project even more personal to me. And you know, add to that feeling of witchiness, hubble bubble, we'll get some lichens going in the dye pots. So it'll be really nice to, to dye up my own contrasting colours for that. Luckily, I'm going to have quite a lot of knitting to do before I get to that point, but I'm going to try and dye two or three different lichen shades for my contrasting colours, just to make it the most perfect dark moory, woodsy, witchy cloak. It's going to be great. I realised just after I'd finished editing the last episode that I had forgotten to include a book review and I was really frustrated with myself because I'd actually, I've been doing quite a lot more reading lately than I have been over the summer. So I do have quite a queue of books that I want to talk to you about. So I was a bit bummed that I missed out on including one in the last episode. But nonetheless, I've got one to chat to you about this time and it is Rocksteady by Ellen Forney. I've really been getting back into reading comics again lately. Um, for those of you who don't know, I also write comics and I have a graphic memoir published called Lighter Than My Shadow. And I'm in the process of starting to think about writing a second one, but cautiously trying not to set too many big goals for myself. Um, now this is Ellen Forney's, I think, second? Book. It's certainly her second 
um, kind of mental health themed graphic novel. Her first one was called Marbles, which was about her um, struggles and diagnosis with bipolar disorder. And this one kind of follows on from that. It's a little bit more kind of less about her specifically and more geared to being a, for want of a better word, self-help book to help people with finding their own balance and their own way forward with bipolar disorder. Um, now I actually, I don't have bipolar disorder, I don't have a mood disorder, but I do have a hormonal condition called PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which has many symptoms in common with bipolar. And in fact, a lot of people with PMDD are often misdiagnosed as bipolar before the true cause of their um, mood swings and, and things are discovered. So I related a lot to what Ellen was talking about in her first book and very much in this book, which is about equipping yourself with tools and rituals and self-care to really manage your own moods. And I just found it really helpful. She's um, The thing I love about Ellen's writing is that she's quite self-deprecating and very funny. So there's, there's a level of humour that makes it feel less heavy as a self-help book. I don't know if, you, if you've ever felt read a self-help book and it just leaves you feeling weighed down with the effort required to do all the things that you need to do and that somehow Ellen's style of writing makes it feel accessible and fun. And I think it's something about the fact that it's in comic form that does that as well. I really like the, um, the addition of pictures as well as the addition of humour. It's just full of really good practical advice um, and I would say it's applicable to anybody who has any kind of mental health or emotional struggle or um, or disorder going on that there's there's advice in this book that would help you it's um, you know really practical tips some of which are applicable and some of which aren't um, so there's a chapter dedicated to sleeping to eating to exercise to medication and obviously not all of those things are going to be applicable to everybody but there's definitely like in each chapter there was a little pearl of wisdom that I was able to take home from it and I really enjoyed it. So yeah, highly recommend Rocksteady by Ellen Forney and um, Marbles as well if you haven't come across it. It's a really moving graphic memoir of her experience living with bipolar. So I really recommend that book as well.
Just before wrapping up this episode, I wanted to share a couple of plans and adventures that I've got coming up in 2020 because, gosh, suddenly 2019 is nearly over and the first half of my next year is already looking full with exciting things that are going to be happening. Um, the first of which is going to be a trip to America in April, the first week of April. Um, it was initially going to be a trip for fun to celebrate my friend Molly's 40th birthday, which I'm, yeah, absolutely really looking forward to. Molly lives outside Chicago, so we we don't get too many opportunities to hang out in person, but for a long time we've been talking about celebrating her special birthday with a trip to New York, so that's going to be happening. But while I'm there in New York, I'm also going to be having a pop-up shop in Brooklyn General Store, which is definitely my favourite yarn and fabric shop in New York. So I feel really honoured that that's going to happen. Um, I'm also going to be travelling up to New Hampshire to have some kind of open studio event at the Woolly Thistle, which is, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. It's going to be a fantastic trip. So hopefully I might get to meet some of you US viewers in person as part of that. I'm also going to be exhibiting at Wonderwall Wales, which is at the end of April, and then at the very first Cornish Fibre Festival, which is at the beginning of May. So those are two shows that are really quite close together. I hadn't thought about that when I applied to both of them. So that's going to be a busy couple of weeks in the Green Bean household. And then in July, I'm taking a trip to Canada. I've never been to Canada before. Um, it's Toronto is the host city for the Graphic Medicine Conference this year, this year, next year. And um, yeah, I decided the time had come for me to make my very first trip to Canada. So I'm hoping to present a paper at that conference and, and enjoy visiting Canada for the first time. Um, apart from traveling and show adventures, I'm really looking forward to making a start on a new issue of The Green Bean next year. That's what you can look forward to seeing come together in this podcast. And behind the scenes, I'm also working with a mentor, Meg John Barker. Um, they're helping me with my, my courage and preparing myself to really get stuck into writing a second graphic novel. It's been six years since my first one came out and I'm feeling... I'm feeling like it's time to make another big comic, so I'll be keeping you posted on that next year as well.
Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Green Bean Podcast. Hope you've enjoyed seeing what I've been working on. If you want to catch us between now and the next episode, the best place to do so is to support us on Patreon. We have a community over there with regular extra episodes and vlogs and it's where you can keep up with what I'm working on in between times and doing so helps to support me and my work and keep this podcast going. If you're one of the lovely people who already supports me over there, thank you so much. Really, it wouldn't be possible without you. Um, if Patreon isn't your thing, you can also find us on Instagram as Katie Greenbean. And of course, we have a group on Ravelry, which is where the Sear Cloak Knit Along will be happening, as well as on Instagram. So I hope to catch you in one of those places between now and the next time. Take care, and I will see you soon. Thanks for watching. Bye. Mm -hmm.